All right, it's uh, 4.45, it's June 5th, 2014. This is the budget, the second series of budget hearings of the City Council of Northampton. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, Secretary to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor LaBarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Council O'Donnell? Here. Council Chair? Here. Council Stein. So, uh, I, well, I'll convene this, this hearing and we start off on the agenda and for those of you who are following at home, if you're going on your online and checking uh, the budget book and for those of you present, uh, page 25 is where you'll find the office of the mayor. And the mayor is here with Susan Wright, the finance director, and you have the floor. Uh, good, good afternoon, members of the city council. Um, I, uh, what we've done is, um, is uh, created a, uh, an analysis of the changes that are happening in my office for FY15. Um, and what you see along the top is basically all of the person, because I think the, there were some questions about the personnel changes that we were making. Um, and uh, the, along the top is basically uh, the PS that's being proposed for fiscal year 2015 um, with the current uh, staffing um, configuration that we're trying to move to. Um, and you'll see that we've taken out of that the license commission just because that's sort of different, that's sort of a new thing that's being added. Um, if you go down below, you'll see uh, we took basically what the pre, uh, what our office looked like pre these changes. Um, and so if no changes had occurred, um, just to give you a sense of what the difference is, total actual fiscal difference is, um, and you'll see that it's a, um, it's a 0.5 FTE and it's $14,242 is the difference. Um, down below you look um, uh, and you'll see that um, I think people focused on uh, the fact that I was uh, promoting Lynn to this new position at a new salary, but if you look at um, what the combined salaries were before, um, it was 90454 If you take the, um, you know, the combined salaries uh, post, it's actually slightly less. Um, and again, part of that is owed to the fact that we had a long, uh, an employee who'd been here for 22 years who had a lot of seniority, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to hiring two brand new people who are coming in at a more entry level uh, position. Um, and so essentially the, the total increase is that $14,000. That's the, that's the difference. I know people have been concerned that I'm adding $50,000 to my budget. That's really not what's occurring here. Um, in terms, and then of course, obviously, we're taking on the additional responsibility of the of the license commission, which is a new function. Um, uh, interestingly, prior to the current configuration, the license commission used to be right out of that office where Cam sits, um, so it was sort of in the mayor's suite at that point. Um, and then we moved um, to a different system, and that position kind of got moved around to a lot of different places for some reasons. Some of them political, some other, other reasons. And, uh, and so now under this new configuration where we have the, um, the uh, city council duties back in the clerk's office, um, and now we have the license commission uh, now as part of the mayor's office budget, this is how it all looks. So I'm happy to answer questions about those uh, changes. Uh, council of Art. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Susan. I talked with Susan during the week in regards how I did have some city employees who approached me when it was announced in the paper mm -hmm. in the Gazette mm -hmm. asking me where the 50,000 came from and I am very pleased about and they said it had nothing to do with the person who has the position mm -hmm. that they had great concerns about where the 50,000 came from and also because all the city employees are only getting a 2% increase in their pay. Mm -hmm. So there was, I'm just saying there, there was concern about that. Most definitely. Okay, but I am happy that you are explaining where that extra money is coming from. Mm -hmm. And again, I think you, you know, many of you know, uh, some of you know Lynn from her time as the council clerk. 
uh, and uh, and she then worked in the uh, in the city clerk's office, and she's been in my staff since I came on board, and uh, and I really want to be able to uh, have her take on more responsibility and take on a more of a leadership role in the organization, and I think she's capable of that, and so that's um, uh, she's taking on a lot more responsibility. Uh, and that's what, and, I, and that's why this new configuration of the office. And I also think it's going to allow me to carry out my duties more effectively. Um, I kind of came in and, and sort of worked within the structure that I inherited, and having had time to kind of uh, think about what would work best, um, this opportunity with the license commission allowed me to make these changes. So I'm very uh, excited about it. And I think we have three really uh, uh, excellent people who will be able to help me serve the constituents uh, and the residents of the city of Northampton. I think Lynn is excellent for the job. I agree when you thought about doing this, even before you made this change, mm -hmm. you had talked about it, Mayor. And I think she is one of the best, and I think she will do an excellent job. Councilor Adams. If I'm reading this right, mm -hmm. the this, this seven year comparison, 2015, it looks like. It's under four hundred thousand, just about three seventy maybe, mm -hmm. three eighty. But the but you're just looking at PNS. I, I was just showing the on this sheet. I'm just showing you the PNS. I'm not showing you the O and M because uh, again, I think people were focusing on he's, he's adding the staff position. So we were just trying to show the pre and post PNS. Um, there, so the O and M total is I think that. You've got the blue and the green. I mean, we don't have much O and M. It's very small. Um, o and O and M is operations yeah. and management to, for folks playing yeah. at home, and uh, P and S is salaries and personnel. And and one of the other changes to note in the mayor's office in the FY uh, third. FY14 budget first night was moved to the mayor's office. If you look at that little chart up at the top, you'll see that the, the salaries were 319 and 14, the OM was 13.8, and first night was 6. First night's been moved to the Arts Council budget as an OM mm -hmm. line item there. So if you look at the OM for 14 in the mayor's office, it was 13.8, and in 15, it's 12. So we've dropped it about $1,800, too. We did take on some of the OM the license commission because we have to order stuff and mm -hmm. there's processing forms that have to happen. But we kind of we took a first night because it was sort of in that limbo that it was in for a while. And I really feel that uh, I want to have Brian Foote, who's you know, he's the Arts Council director, but I really view him as our kind of director of arts and culture, not just the Arts Council, but all kinds of other things, the cultural district, et cetera. And this is just sort of a pass through. The money is put in the budget, and then it's basically paid to first night as our contribution to first night. So that's why we felt that it should really be in the arts uh, department budget. So. so, And just one other thing on the FTE chart. You can see in 14 there were seven FTEs, and in 15 there's eight. And again, that goes back to what the mayor just explained. One FT, well, half of that FTE is the license commission person that came in, and the other half is is the true addition. Is it, it's the addition of the half FTE. In this, in FTE this is full time employee. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And Councilor Adams, you saw the report. I, I, are those factors as to why the, in the last three years the budget for the department's gone up one hundred thirty thousand dollars? The other piece of that is when the um, uh, the we economic development director had been previously part of paid for out of CDBG funds um, and when our CDBG funds got slashed uh, considerably um, we made the decision to put that to make keep that position but make it convert it to a general fund position so that may also be explaining some of that increase uh, particularly um, after 2012 uh, we pulled the um, Mayor Higgins had created a, a kind of a standalone department, which was uh, Cam, Peggy, uh, uh, Cam, Peg. It was actually Michael Owens, and then it was um, uh, Terry Anderson. Yeah, so they had a four-person office. Our CDBG got cut about 30%. Um, and so, uh, and also I felt we couldn't justify using all CDBG to pay for an economic development director, because they were doing way more than just um, CDBG-related work. So. 
that department you may remember got dissolved in my FY13 budget and we pulled it we pulled it into to, to my office so that's the other piece of it Th those funds were being were sort of there was sort of this artificial department right next to the mayor's office and we pulled it all into the mayor's office um, so that's the other I think that's another reason why there's that increase that you see in, in 13 14 and 15 so I think, I think if you look at 2009 to the budget and salaries that was actually expended was 290 and I think 2009 may have been the last year that um, then economic development Terry Anderson was actually being paid out of the mayor's office mm -hmm. and I think her salary dropped off because it was CDPG funded and then it came back on and if you look at the main uh, expenditure page you can see um, it was CDBG funds. If you look at that first page, page 15, in 2011, it was for economic development. It's in that first section, general government, um, page 15. It says community and economic development, 5,941, and then the next year, 4,005. That was the only part of the general fund that was paying for Terry Anderson. The rest was all coming from CDBG. So that's. So I think you can see in 2009, the budget was actually fairly close to the 2013 budget. Mm -hmm. Councilor Adams, you still have the floor if you want. Thank you. You're done. Mm -hmm. Council Barge. All right, so, and I know you had explained this, Mayor, a year ago in regards, even with Terry, when Terry's position, there was some movement there. We did know that the CDBG, that Pat Keller and Kim were coming into your office under the CDBG. Mm -hmm. And also, when our new economic developer came in, we knew then that you were putting that position in your office. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it just seemed it didn't seem it didn't make a lot of sense to have a two-person department, um, and so we, we uh, so that's why we um, why we just decided to put it in the mayor's office. And CDBG is a is a function that's directly controlled by the mayor, so it made sense um, to do that. So Another reason there's a drop in 2012 is. Um, Chris Powell retired in April, mm -hmm. and while I took over in April, I was still being paid completely out of the school department. So there's there's a hefty chunk there that didn't occur because it was a vacancy. Other other questions? I should say that in discussions about um, when Mary Madura um, moved to the police department. The mayor and I were in frequent discussions about what's the best way to essentially realign and re-sign the responsibilities, especially in, in re reflecting the charter and the will of the charter describing division of powers. And um, Mary's position actually sort of came under the aegis of the mayor's office and the council and could set up a potential conflict. The legal department for um, licensing and then for us, and then traditionally, I think you'll find in other communities that the uh, council secretary is associated with the clerk's office, and the legal uh, all legal issues are under the executive branch and under the executive's aegis. And it made more sense to have them be two separate people as it was once upon a time. Uh, it should be pointed out that, and I think the mayor did, is that. Um, uh, Lynn Nuttleman at the time, now Lynn Simmons, was uh, did Mary's job as the uh, under licensing as well. So she was she's well versed in that. As, and this hopefully will be a seamless transition. Um, what we put Pam through is virtually inexcusable, but we're, she's, she is a woman of great endurance and patience, and, and is is and uh, we're grateful for that. But clearly, I don't think we're paying her anywhere near enough for what she has to experience of this. But that that was the reasoning behind this, and and it just all the things made more sense, and they sort of jived with how things have been done in this town, in the city historically. Um, but as the mayor said, the job sort of was jury rigged, and um, in at since the opportunity availed itself, it made sense to do this realignment. And I think this is working very well. Um, any other questions for the? I wanted to move on to the legal, if you have. Yeah, I would do. Okay. Legal, but go ahead, Council. 
No, no, that's okay. I'll okay. ask if we can move it. Yeah. So we have a chart. Um, actually, it's a one, one page or two pages? It's a two, okay, it's two, two pages. pages. Yeah. I was trying to copy yeah. it. Off, but um, where we've gone through and, um, and done a history of the legal budget. Um, and, uh, and you'll By see. Way, page 37 for the review. Exactly. Um, and so you'll see that uh, you may remember, uh, well, some of you who were on the council, some not, that my, in my first budget in 2013, I talked about um, trying to move away from uh, uh, an over reliance on free cash, trying to act more accurately budget these numbers. Um, and so by way of just by way of illustration and legal was one of those it was legal snow and ice uh, veterans benefits um, and uh, why am I spacing on the fourth one? Uh, fire overtime. Fire overtime. Um, so just to illustrate that if you look at the FY 2012 budget book um, the legal legal department was budgeted ninety six thousand dollars for the FY 12 budget. Um, that's what was that was what was adopted by the council was ninety five thousand dollars because the practice had always been you really you look you put a low number in there and then you just come back for transfers come back for transfers and so we've tried to really move away from that um, and be less reliant on free cash transfers so you may remember in thirteen we started adding more to the legal budget adding more to the veterans budget each year to try to get up to a more realistic number. Um, so 2012, so 2013, 2014 today, and 2015 budgeted, you can see that this year, for 15, we're proposing uh, 225,000. That may or may not get us to where we want to be. We may increase that even more. Um, if you look at the second page, you can see over 12, 13, and 14 um, what the various expenses are by category. And so we say municipal law, and what we mean by that is just all of the kind of um, general municipal legal questions, you know, charter stuff, ordinance stuff, um, uh, you know, uh, looking at stuff for TPW, easements, you know, any of those kinds of things, land acquisitions, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other one is employment labor law. Obviously, the city solicitor is in charge of municipal law. Um, and then we have separate labor council, Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn, that does our employment and labor law. And you can kind of see how the, the, the spread between the two, um, you know, uh, uh, legal and, and labor, you know, the blue is 12, the, the uh, yellow is 13, and uh, the darker color is 14. You can see, for example, the spike um, in labor costs in 13 because we had not only the uh, JLMC but all of our a lot most of our contracts were in negotiation so we had a lot more expenses um, there was also uh, you know a spike in 12 um, uh, related to uh, uh, municipal legal uh, costs as well and then it went really down so it's, it's very cyclical depending on the issues that we're dealing with um, in 13 on the municipal side I assumed some of the charter uh, work that had to be done. Alan did that whole review with the Charter Ordinance Committee to go through all the ordinances and, and all that. Um, and then we've got some smaller, which are kind of one-time expenses, uh, like the bid lawsuit, um, where we have outside counsel that's handling that case. Um, and then we have some environmental uh, related uh, uh, legal issues where we have hired very specialized uh, you know, people that are experts in 21 e site kind of thing. Um, we had the one time issue around the casino where we had to hire special counsel for that. Um, and then we've just got some miscellaneous kinds of cases. Then off to the side, you see cable because every 10 years we have to renegotiate our cable contract. And there's like two or three people in the state who that's what they, that's all they do is specialize in, in, um, uh, grinding it out with Comcast or, or the other uh, folks uh, to, to help us renegotiate that. And that's like a three-year process. So that's kind of the breakdown of the types of different expenses. Um, but I think the big takeaway is we're trying to get to a more realistic budgeted number, um, even though legal expenses are cyclical, depending on what happens, what, you know, what kind of a contract year we have, what kinds of lawsuits arise, et cetera. Councilor Adams. Does municipal include like police department payroll matter? Uh, no, in that case, um, yes. yes, it yes. would actually. It does. Yeah, um, I was thinking of another. We've had a couple of other police matters where we did have an outside counsel in, in very 
limited fashion, but yeah. And that, that, would, and that would be in the miscellaneous. That would be in the miscellaneous, but yeah, anything related to that, any kinds of um, uh, other, you know, um, you know, we had the settlement with the uh, former hotel developer at Glaston Park. I mean, there's numbers of things like that, lawsuits that are, are going on, um, as well as, you know, working with on claims, working with the city council, um, and so that's kind of the, the breakdown. Do we know when the business improvement district suits will be settled? Do you have any expected date on that? Um, uh, well, I know that folks came before the council to tell you that it was going to happen next month, but I've been hearing that for probably the last three years, that it's going it's to go to trial next month. I know that um, there are uh, settlement discussions going on, and I know that a, a, a judge is, has gotten some initial uh, briefs or appearances by the parties, and, um, and I don't know where that is. I, our goal, obviously, is to, is to have it resolved outside of court. Um, we'll have to see. Um, and then there's a separate case, which is actually, we're not really playing a very central role in because the attorney, the, the, the state suit, the attorney general has actually taken on um, because it's essentially it's a suit saying that the legislature acted illegally. Um, and our kid, and I, we're like, why should Northampton have to defend the legislature? So, um, so actually the attorney general is taking lead chair on that. Um, but so yeah, so we're waiting to find out um, my hope is we can get that resolved, and we won't have another um, we won't have another year of uh, of the bid attorney. Yeah. And how come Solicitor Seawall's payment is not listed here? This seems like every employee is listed, and his is not. He he. Well, his payment is he's a, ben he's he's a, a vendor. vendor, so he's paid. He's not paid as a municipal employee. He's a. Well, can can we have that amount? I mean, the amounts is, the amounts we pay him. We can sure. certainly get that, sure. Thank yeah, you. yeah. I mean, he bills our his well, his firm bills us um, because it's not only Solicitor Seawall. He has part. He has uh, some of his partners specialized, particularly in land and title work, and so some of that stuff that happens uh, on you know rail trail stuff or the the um, open space stuff goes to them. But we can certainly get that for you. Yeah. So he um, he uses the firm rather than have like assistance because in the past there've been assistant solicitors, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, n n well, I'm not really, that it goes back to like the legal office days when there was actually an in-house legal counsel. There might have been assistant counsel. It was Joe Cook, actually. Um, but typically, there's a city solicitor, uh, and then they they use whatever they use whatever resources they need. Um, but in the case of specialized things like the real estate um, and title work, um, he happens to have someone in his firm that does that. So that's they, they handle that. I don't think we've had a, a, an in-house attorney in that ca uh, capacity since uh, Attorney Fallon. That's correct. Um, uh, that's been 19, 20 years. Something, yeah. So. And Attorney Fallon's uh, secretary did the license commission. Right. Work as right. Well. Um, Council Farmer. Thanks. Uh, maybe along the same line. So I know we have the category of employment labor law, and um, and we switched over. Um, from, uh, it was previously. I'm not sure what what time period. So was Elaine Real still in 2012, or had we already switched to Sullivan? For part of 12. Um, I think. Was you? When did you take off? That's when you were appointed. Well, there was a good there was a good number of months I think in half between. Half twelve for Alan. Yeah, right. Half twenty twelve, half up until December. It was, okay. It was, and she was labor and. Solicitor. Right. So so I'm looking at so that, I mean I know that we talked about that category. I mean the 2013 spike is related to the JLMC and the number of contracts negotiated. That's a mm -hmm. that's a big. So I'm just wondering if there's any also discrepancy between the you know the change of firms and maybe along those same lines since we'll be supplying about you know a bill a vendor bill from uh seawall maybe we could have one that just shows that time period from elaine riel and from sullivan and hayes just a comparison okay we can try to, we can try to pull we would have to take we would have to take uh attorney reels bills and go through them and divide what was labor law and what was municipal so we have because she was doing like all, that. she was the entire Well, for a time, there, for that period where, I mean, she used to just be the labor lawyer, 
And then when Janet Shepard resigned, she kind of was became city solicitor and continued to do labor. And then for a short for a short stint when we first started with Alan's firm, Seawall firm for city solicitor, was that just a few months? Not very long at all. No, it was not very long at all. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, she, even just, yeah. Maybe we don't have that comparison, just right. the, the figures from. Yeah, we can try to pull that out. Yeah. I mean, I, we're, we're, I mean, Sullivan Hayes is billing at the same rate. I mean, and Allen's billing at the same rate that that we've been paying city solicitors for 20 years in terms of hourly rate. Um, and the same as, it, um, okay, so there's yeah. no difference really uh, between the billing rate from Real Associates Sullivan and Hayes and Seawall. I'll, I'll have to look back at that, oh. yeah. But I'm pretty sure, at least on the municipal side, it's the same rate. Um, in terms of the, the labor side, it might have gone up in this fiscal year when we, we negotiated the contract. I'll have to figure that. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I will say that, that um, well, I, I won't get into the comment on that, but it's fine. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm very pleased with the legal representation. Even sampling doesn't need to be important. Yeah. Sample. Yeah. Councilor Klein and Councilor Bart. Um, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the miscellaneous legal expenses are comprised of. Uh, some of those are just um, small lawsuits. I think there's been you know, in the police department, little little ones. They're, they've been like two and three thousand dollar bills. Yeah. They haven't been large. Yeah. So, um, for example, uh, when <coughs> we had the um, uh, odd, well, strange case of, of the DA had um, uh, dropped, well, I can't really quite remember how that all worked out. Through, um, this was the, uh, he, he decriminalized but then didn't, um, didn't actually plead it out or, or the, the case, we actually hired a special prosecutor to help us figure out what to do. It ended up, we ended up, it just, the matter got dropped, but we hired somebody who was a former prosecutor um, to help us figure out, investigate it and figure out what to do. Um, he was a former ADA, and again, it was like $2,500, um, but it was sort of uncharted territory that we had never done before. Um, so that's one example. I'd have to, I'd have to look at the other one. Yeah, I mean, it, in Munis, we can sort it by the attorney that was paid, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's pretty easy because we know that one attorney only did that one issue. So, yeah, there was that one. Um, the other thing that's in miscellaneous legal, at least for um, 12 and part of 13, was like your mailbox claims mm -hmm. and other things that counsel. We've switched that around, but under that is like. We used to pay, but it, the claims used to get paid out of the legal budget. Um, which it still is, but we, but we, um, but that's we used to track that separately um, when claims were paid out. Now they get paid out directly by the insurance company, um, but that's that's that was, those were also miscellaneous legal as well. And also, Councilor Klein. Yes, thank you. Councilor Labarge. Yep. So we have Attorney Alan Seawald mm -hmm. and Sullivan and who? Primarily, um, we have one attorney assigned to us, but it's the firm of Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn in Holyoke. In Holyoke? Yes, exactly. Yep. So, Alan Seawald handles municipal law, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And miscellaneous legal is handled by who? Uh, those were just now those, it's insurance companies people have that's right and those were just some very small that didn't really rise to giving them their own little category on the chart so we just created this miscellaneous so it wasn't like the bid or the casino or this environment or the environmental stuff so we just anything that didn't fit into one of those plus these claims we put into the miscellaneous now with attorney real didn't she also handle some of the lawsuits and planning where she had somebody working with her who just specialized in planning? Um, I forget what his name is, but I think he's still with her. Uh, well, um, there was an attorney, Lucentini, who she some, I mean, I should say that when when um, Attorney Real was the city solicitor, she also, out, you know, I don't want to use the term outsourced, but she called in specialists yeah, right. uh, to work on cases. Mr. Lucentini actually, argued a case before the SJC on behalf of the police department and he did some other cases and actually the environmental work started under uh, the previous administration um, 
Lou Moore is a local attorney in town that specializes in environmental, and so he was retained under the previous administration. We've continued to use him. So um, she even did the same thing. I will say um, it was not a um, it was not an ideal situation to have the same lawyer doing labor and the general counsel work, um, and most communities don't do that. Um, just because they're somewhat specialized, it also um, the city solicitor has to work with departments mm -hmm. um, uh, on just all kinds of the run of the mill legal issues, but then they also have this relationship of collective bargaining. So it's sort of an awkward to try to do both, to try to wear both hats. Um, I would assume that every city must have a city solicitor. Right? Yeah, they, they do. Yes, they do. And, and, um, and most of the cities around us also have a separate you know, labor council as well. I think we used to have effort. Didn't he handle school committee? Elaine, Elaine was our labor counsel. Oh, was yes, she? she was our labor counsel. That's what correct. did Etheridge do? He used to do general legal for the schools. Yeah. And then the schools okay. had the school labor. has its own labor counsel as well. That that's part of their budget, and they hired their own labor counsel. They actually have moved to Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn um, as well. They don't have the same lawyer, but they uh, renewed their contract and went to Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn. Um, so we both have the same labor firm on both school and city. So if, and I brought this to our council president, Bill Dwight, at one point us counselors were sued by another counselor, and um, I remember going to court, sitting there with our mayor and that. My question is, does Alan Seawald, would he represent us if we're going to be sued by somebody? Uh, he he represents you know all, you know he would help represent all city employees. It would depend on the circumstances, what the nature of the suit. Oddly was. enough, in that circumstance, the mayor hired a separate attorney, Alan Seawald. Yeah, he did. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Seawald represented the council. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was done in pretty short order. It was found. It was ungrounded. Yeah, and the charges were not yeah validated. But the, yeah. And we hired separate, you know, we, we, you may remember when, we, when I was on the council with you, uh, the city's, then city solicitor hired Michael Pill to help advise us on the zoning exactly. for the landfill. So we've hired, it's, it's not uncommon to hire separate council. Okay. I'd like to ask you about the casino. I remember that there was some discussion of uh, potentially uh, business owners who would also experience the, the uh, impact of the yeah. casinos were talking about contributing. And to that the, was on the, it was more for the study. And, right. uh, and I've been talking with the chamber about that, about getting those, uh, commit, calling in those commitments. Those and come to pass. Yeah. It hasn't, but, but put it on me, not them, because okay. I have not. I've been uh, working on other things, but that is but still some something business owners work as a litigant. On. Yeah. The legal piece was just, I mean, yeah. the legal piece was, the, was our cost of going through the process, which the community had to go through. Right. Um, and, you know, I won't go into characterizing how we, we're treated in that process, but seeing how it's all playing out now, it's rather interesting. So, um, but that's fine. Uh, so yeah, so that that legal piece of it was always something we were taking on, and either Alan was going to do it, but he really didn't have the, you know, that's the piece of this that, um, you know, for him to spend the time to get up to speed on casino law and learn everything about casino law when there's firms out there that were already specializing in it, it didn't make a lot of sense. It wasn't a good use of his time. Um, so that's why we, in cases like that, we bring in outside counsel. The bid is obviously a little bit different because Alan has recused himself from anything to do with the bid, which is why we have outside counsel. The, um, we are actually five minutes over on this interview, but is there any, are there any other questions? I mean, we're on a tight timeline because we have to actually run across the parking lot at some point and then convene our next meeting. And all the same principal people will be there. But are there any other questions? Uh, thank you very much, Your Honor, and you, Susan, thank you again. Thank you, Appreciate your time, and we'll see you at 7.05. Yeah, and I do want to apologize in advance because I have right. Smith Vocational graduation tonight. Um, it starts at 6.30, so I'll be shaking and handing out diplomas as fast as I can and then coming back down to the council meeting. So hopefully I'll be there by 8 or 8.30. And, and Susan will be Susan there. will be there yeah, to answer questions. questions. I don't know if you'll get to the budget piece of that, but... Um, Okay. So, next up, parking, tax collector and parking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stay for that. You're going to stay for that? Since I supervise that. Right. So you don't.
Susan just doesn't like missing the This is uh, uh, page 53 in your, uh, in your hymnals. Uh, 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 all right, you guys have the floor. I don't know if, um, what's your preference? I, I have page 53. Did I write it wrong? My bad. Hang on a sec. It's, here we go, 33. My, my five, yeah, it, my three looks like a five. My bad. Okay, we're all set. Yes, we're, okay. we're ready. We're on the proper page. All right, so um, as you know, I supervise auditor, uh, assessor, collector, and uh, treasurer, and you only asked for the collector's office, so that's Hi. good. Um, yeah. <laughs> collector and parking are here. Um, Debbie Dunphy is the assistant uh, collector. Nancy Forrestal heads the parking enforcement division. So um, I'll just let each of them quickly talk about the budget. And then if you want any more data on parking and revenues and stuff, we're, we're ready to answer that. Who wants to go first, Debbie? I can go first. Okay. Um, the only thing that the collector's budget has that's different, our budget pretty much stays the same, is the contractual services. You'll see it went up 1,000% from 2,500 to 27,500. And that's because we are going to the lockbox as of July 1st. So our tax bills are going to be, can be mailed to a lockbox. The citizens can pick and choose the lockbox now. It will go to a place out in Worcester. So the tax bills will go there and this company is going to scan them and process the payments. Any payments that don't match, they're only going to do exactly what matches. If the check doesn't match or the things don't match up properly, that will get sent back to, uh, back to us and we'll handle it there. So we're going to start out with just the exact stuff right Can now. Can you explain a little bit about, about the lockbox? Because I think most of us only know that Al Gore was talking about one of them. I don't think you're talking about the same lockbox. No. What it is is they'll get their tax bills and they will have an envelope in their tax bill. Right now they can pay cash, check, online with Unipay, or with debit or credit. Or now they can send it to this lockbox in Worcester. So this company takes the payments, scans the payments, processes the payments, deposits the money, sends us daily an amount that's been paid, and we will download that amount. So it's just a different way of processing our payments. It's automated now. And is, it, is there protection for liability of loss and things like that or um, in the process? Of oh, that? yes. yes. Okay. This is a pretty common practice across the Commonwealth, and we actually had the Department of Revenue come in, and I had the department look at the four offices that I supervise and give me recommendations for you know, modernization, efficiencies, et cetera. And this was one of the number one things that they suggested for the collector's office, because the collector's office has three clerks, has Debbie and Lissa, and there are times when mail is, is, we're unable to open the mail uh, in a timely fashion because there's just so much volume that comes in. So what this will do is it'll allow the four, three clerks and, and Debbie to keep up with the mail because they're not going to have to deal with the very straightforward ones. It will give them more time. And with the addition of the new stormwater fee, while it's going to be billed on the water and sewer bills, it's still a lot, it's, a, it's additional work for the collector's office because now they have to take the bill and instead of recording payments to two accounts, they're going to have to take every bill and record payments to three accounts. So in light of the fact that their workload was increasing and the Department of Revenue recommended it as an efficiency, we, the mayor decided he wanted to go in that direction. So people can still come to your office. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's just another form of payment for them. You know, a lot of the customers want an envelope in their tax bill, and they want to be able to mail out a, a payment. This is the opportunity if they want to just mail it in, and this company will handle it. Um, unless you have a question about this specifically, I was hoping okay. I'd just move on. Uh, just a quick question. Okay, Council LaBarge and Council Carney. Go ahead, Council. Council LaBarge. Thank you, um, Also to um, Debbie, in question, on the stormwater utility fee, because I had emailed the mayor a couple of months ago of great concerns. I've had residents calling, but they were hoping that the stormwater, the new one, utility fee would be separate. It would not be added on to another bill. And also, residents were complaining that the months of January, February is extremely hard 
for people here in the city of Northampton because everything keeps coming in all at once. So how are they handling that bill? Um, the, yeah, the, the ordinance that was passed calls for quarterly billing and to be, it, to be done in conjunction with the water and sewer bills. So if there were changes, it would have to go through an ordinance change. So right now that's how it's set up. Am I correct, Jim? Just a quick question. So, um, just wondering if there's any way to say, uh, I don't know what percentage of folks do the unit pay. I do the money in them. If it's a large number of people, is there any way to not send the, on, the extra envelope? We haven't been sending the envelope for years. But oh, now, okay. if you have the lockbox, you have to give them a place to send it to. So, that's why we have the envelope now for the lockbox only. Okay, so uh, so you're not sending the. I know, that, so you won't be sending out an envelope, correct one. That's so I just misunderstood. Every tax saying. bill will get the yes. lockbox envelope. It will give them an extra option to pay. Mm -hmm. Unipay is getting very popular. I will say that. All right. I, well, yeah. so I'm just wondering if there's a way that a per I'll do that offline. It just, just seems like there's a, there might be a way to save save people sending everybody an envelope who mm -hmm. just put it in the recycling. Mm -hmm. Save money. Debbie, you may proceed if you like, or if you're all. Done. I believe that's the only change. Okay. Unless anybody has any questions for us, that's pretty much the only change that we have. Are there any other questions? Okay, Nancy. You're up. So parking already has um, a process where uh, payments can be made online, in person, over the phone, um, uh, over the counter with debit credit. So we are not in a position where we have to um, institute the lockbox system. Um, therefore, we don't have to go in that direction. Um, we are um, hoping that uh, two new vehicles will be authorized, the purchase of two new vehicles, um, and that these will be electric vehicles. Um, the two vehicles that we currently have um, in service are approximately nine years old. Um, they may have low mileage, but they have a lot of hours on them. Um, they are not in good shape, and they are starting to cost the city um, money, you know, nickel and diamond, definitely. Um, so uh, the idea of having the, the two new vehicles, um, especially where we already have charging stations, um, would be very beneficial to the department, and I believe to the city. There, there was discussion of uh you're right, the parking enforcement officers so that vehicles that were um, uh, electric vehicles, right. much more efficient and much more durable over time. Um, Councilor O'Donnell. You have a, a total of, of two vehicles currently, and right. you're replacing them both. Exactly. Okay. And there's no need for a third or fourth? No. Okay. So. I'm not eager to, you know, no, buy more cars. I was curious because you have a whole city to cover. No, we, we cover um, a large section of Florence and also the downtown area, in particular the downtown business district and um, areas that kind of um, spread off of that. But um, a number of the officers are walking right. because we believe that um, the coverage is, is done very efficiently by walking through the parking lots up and down the streets. I think the electric vehicles are great. And we did get a grant. Um, Chris Mason was successful in getting a grant, so I think $7,500 of each of those vehicles is going to be covered by grant funds. So. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Any, any, uh, Councilor Klein? I'm just looking at the um, personnel here, and we have um, five named folks, and then they're part time PEOs. Um, I'm wondering what that means I mean what kind is it hourly or why aren't they kind of in this list of the different parking enforcement officers well we have four full-time officers um, at $35 a week and then we have two um, who work up to 19 hours a week um, they um, cover holidays um, filling when someone calls in sick um, vacation. vacation time things like that I'm just interested because I see that we have one part-time person listed here, but then this category of part-time that isn't made specific, so I was curious. Oh, the reason that um, George Bro Beaupre is listed, he's 50-50. He's 50% parking maintenance and 50% parking enforcement. So we list him because he is a full-time employee for the city. But the others are kind of 
you know, we, we sometimes can get people that maybe can only give us 10 hours a week. So we have just a pool of kind of these intermittent, and those are the ones that we kind of tap when we have a vacancy in the full time because we they're known and kind of everything. Um, I did bring some parking revenue information. I was that was going to be right. Now. So I'll, I'll pass that out because um, I thought these guys should you guys should know the the oh, keep this way, the volume of money that's going through these two offices. Um, so I did a comparison in twenty. Back in time, parking revenue was kept by the lot, by the garage, so you could analyze it. There was a period of time where all the parking revenue got lumped together. It was in only two accounts, parking revenue and, and parking tickets. So in 2012, um, or excuse me, in 2013, we started to separate it out into four categories. So. The first category, so this is going to allow us to do an analysis, um, and it, it'll also prove very helpful when we get the new parking systems in and we start to get the parking, the ones on the street where you can use debit cards, because I think there's going to be a drop in tickets and an increase in revenue when it's made easier for people to pay with a debit card. And this is going to help us track that so we can kind of observe whether that's a trend or not. But as far as the parking revenue, parking passes, um, I gave you a chart that compares the first quarter, second quarter, and third quarter um, with 2013. Um, and the fourth quarter, of course, we don't have for 2014. Uh, parking garage revenue, you can see in 2013, brought in 592,000. Uh, total to date right now for 14 is 450, so we're on track there. Parking lot revenue in 2013 brought in 424,000. And um, to date we have 325, so we're a little ahead there. And then an on-street parking revenue last year brought in 698,000. And then parking ticket revenue, you can see down below, total for 2013 was 933. So if you look at the bottom, I just kind of compare, are we ahead or behind in a comparison with last quarter? So everything, when you include parking passes, garage, lots, on street, and tickets, first quarter we were ahead 9,000, second quarter we were behind 4,968, third quarter we're a little further behind. 26,000. So total to date right now, our revenues for all of these five categories are about 21,000 behind last year. I think part of that's due to the winter that we had. I think that revenue was down. And do you have an answer no. for that? And you have an answer for that too. Okay, good. We do. We do. Um, what happens is Nancy's parking deposits are a couple days behind our deposits. So I only do parking once a week, and it's basically on Fridays. I wait till I have all my information gathered. So. I think we're a week or two behind what's, what gets put into the general ledger. So just to say, I haven't done the last week of May yet, so I'm going to do that tomorrow. In four days alone, we deposited 49485 So some of the figures aren't going to show up on here because when she runs it in the general ledger, I haven't posted everything yet. So I think I gave Nancy a figure also for a week. We figured out that we $30,000 for the two weeks that she may be off. So we, we seem to be on target. Okay, so, okay. so the best the best assessment of, of how our inventories are is once once the year is complete and we can look back right. and compare right. them to other years. Right. And and there are other areas that I think that are important, um, other areas of revenue. Um, uh, fines from uh, tickets issued out to um, people who are parked illegally in um, handicapped spots. Um, last year was over... Uh, for fiscal year 14, over $4,000. Um, and that money is going towards disability. Commission uh, on disability. Right. So, uh, and, and we are also um, working very, very hard to get the forged, expired, and misused to handicap placards off of the street. Um, last year, we confiscated 41 of them, forged, misused, um, uh, altered. Uh, this year, just um, since January, we're up to 17 of them. So, and these are, some of them are very well done, and some of them are just people who are using um, some that are expired a little bit. But, you know, you, you have people out there who are using permits that are you know, from 2003, 1997, uh, 
So we are working very hard in getting those off of the, off of the street and um, out of people's hands that are misusing them. Also, the meter bag system, where we are um, making uh, meter bag rentals um, available to contractors, um, to citizens who are trying to move in and out of uh, apartments or business owners that are trying to move in and out. Um, fiscal 20, excuse me, fiscal 13, $26,499 um, was um, obtained through that source and revenue for 2014 uh, is already over $21,000. So there are other um, areas of revenue that I think are important to, to be brought up and to be acknowledged. Yeah. I just want to go back to the parking ticket uh, revenue. At some point, and I'm not sure that it shows up here, in the, and so at some point we did raise, we increased our parking tickets by about 50%. So is there a point where we see a comparable 50% in income on parking tickets, or is it more, is it, we see a, uh, fewer tickets as a result of the increased fine, or is there, do we have a, a point where we can see a reflection of that change in ordinance? We did the, ticket increase in fiscal 12. Mm -hmm. That's when we did the, we, we also increased the parking rates right. um, and the tickets. Um, and we, But we also had, I think it's a little cloudy because we had a change in leadership in the department as well, so it's a little hard to totally. To Just in a guesstimate, did we see a comparable increase then? The, uh, I, know, I know it's a couple of years ago. Tickets, I have the, I asked um, Nancy to get me this. Tickets in 2011 were, for, we issued 41,000 roughly in 2011. We issued 54,000 in 2012. I got that. And, <laughs> and 2013, it's 46,000. And in 20, I mean, excuse me, 2013, 46,000. And 2014 were about the same as 2013. Okay. So, so yeah, there's a, there's a few things going on. And I Council think Paul. you're, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think that you're also seeing um, uh, an increase in the number of um, long-term permits that are being purchased by people um, for the long-term parking lots. Um, we're averaging about 250 of those permits a month that are being um, purchased, and um, so that's you know $45 per permit, um, a little over $11,000 a month. I just wanted to ask, has the staffing changed significant, significantly over the years, you know, the last four or five years? or From 2012 yes. to, to halfway through 2012 when leadership of the parking department changed, staffing changed. Mm -hmm. We were not staffing prior to January of 2012. We were not staffing up to par on weekends, and there was just basically no coverage when there was sick and vacation. So those gaps have been filled. So we're seeing the income kind of uh, directly related to the number of folks that we have doing this work. Can you describe, um, we had a new garage come online that was at the police station. Um, Not a lot of revenue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, and, and it's less than a it's thousand bucks. It's a tiny, point, tiny. Yeah. Uh, we just started that. Let's see. November? $84.10 for the month. December was $121.70. It's pretty small. It's not, yes. it's, 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 not, it's not a lot. It's, it's minimal. We get it maybe why that might be, or? every couple of weeks. They collect it. I'm not, you know, David Pomerantz and I were talking about this, uh, that we may not be, you know, people may not realize that they right. can actually park there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's a it's a education kind of thing. And again, I think when we get into putting in the new systems, we get the new garage system in, we get the new on street, you know, swipe cards. We're going to have to, you know, get a better kind of coordinated response to here's all the places you can park. And I think it's going to be real. I think it's going to be really interesting when people can pay more easily and not have to run out of change in their pocket. I, I really do think we're going to see tickets go down and revenues go up, which I think is a good thing because I'd rather have people pay more to park than get a ticket. So, but this data will help us get a handle on that. I know so. this isn't exactly the time to talk about this, but I've had two different people talk to me about the signage. They find the signage really confusing and contradictory. Um, in one place it says one thing, in another place it says another thing, and people are having a hard time figuring out, you know, that they can park there and when and how and all of that kind of thing. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Oh, Appreciate your time. Thank you, Debbie. Yes. Thank you. Well, now we're running 10 minutes behind. <laughs> so, now you're all. Uh, next up, we have the Department of Public Works, and in fact, actually, um, actually, Ned, if you want to come up first yep. and uh, give your description and overview. And So, Ned, anyway, for, you can give the overview, and, and, and then, of course, the first up is the discussion of stormwater, which is, which is of keen interest to folks, too. So, mm -hmm. if you could describe that and, and explain. Sure. Uh, first, I want to start off that I want to recognize my staff that's here with me tonight. We have Anne Marie Levy, our financial administrator, Jim Laurel, our city engineer, and Rich Parsley, our highway department uh, supervisor. So I want to go over some of the highlights from uh, last year that we accomplished and what we're planning to do this year. Is it um, Terry's talking? Pardon me? No, is it Terry's Terry's, I don't see Terry here no, now. It's, yeah, we're just, yeah, I think Ned's got it covered. Yeah. You, you got some memos on that somewhere at some point, right? About stormwater? <laughs> yeah, just a few. <laughs> just a so few. Yeah, you, might, you might have a vague idea of what's going on. So one of the big things they undertook in 2014 was looking at the private ways in the city and the conversion to public ways. Um, the task came out of the Inspector General's ruling that the public funds could not be expended to maintain the private ways, uh, particularly snow plowing. So DPW's staff coordinator provided the necessary information to the Board of Public Works and held public hearings on over 40 private ways. Currently there's 30 private ways under contract for surveying services and the city solicitor will provide in those legal street acceptance documents to the city council this year for you. I was hoping to get it done by summer, but it might be towards the fall by the time we get there. Uh, Public Works continues to work on inventory and asset management plans for short-term and long-term infrastructure improvements for stormwater and flood control, water pavement, and wastewater systems. The comprehensive wastewater management plan is ongoing, should be finished this calendar year. Um, we're also working on asset management plans or finishing asset management plans for water. We've done our pavement management and um, we had a report done for stormwater in the city. Uh, DPW staff supported extensively the city council and the stormwater ad hoc advisory task force for the uh, new enterprise fund that's looking to be passed this year. Um, we continue to do work, maintenance work on the Mill River Diversion Channel uh, as required by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and uh, starting to put together documents for the uh, Connecticut River maintenance. Uh, Glendale Road uh, uh, landfill is obviously closed in April of 2013. We still have the landfill gas energy plant there. Uh, we did permit a, a transfer station at the landfill for residents. Uh, it takes in most everything but uh, recyclables and solid waste. The local street facility does that. As you know, uh, King or North Street was completely redone with new water, uh, sewer, drain, and um, pavement, sidewalks. Uh, I thought the project came out great underneath the engineering staff at DPW. Some other highlights was that uh, we secured about $140,000 in grants for watershed land protection and dam removal from the state. And we still have another $35,000 watershed land grant pending. Hopefully we'll be uh, done by the end of this fiscal year. Uh, we've uh, applied and received uh, about $1.6 million in uh, FEMA grants for two projects, the River Road Retaining Wall Project and the um, <coughs> erosion uh, situation down below Mizani Beach. So those two projects total a little over uh, two million, but the reimbursement should be about 1.6 million. So we're working on the obligation paperwork for that. Uh, this upcoming year, uh, uh, obviously the big things we'll be doing is uh, Hinkley Street reconstruction, be working on that for bidding. Uh, we're looking at uh, a number of issues at the wastewater treatment plant we're trying to address, uh, water issues, uh, sludge management issues down there. Uh, those were coming out of the, uh, some of the uh, results from the, some of the tasks from the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. But we wanted to get a head start on some of these uh, critical needs first. Uh, one of the other big ones uh, down at the wastewater plant is the backup generator system and switch gearing. We had a failure of it, and we have a temporary generator down there that's being rented. So we're looking this coming year to uh, put on an RFP for design and hopefully look for uh, some kind of construction the following year, FY16. Um, the biggest change in the general fund we have this year is um, uh, Florence Fields. 
It was a huge increase in our budget because of that, uh, 24 acres of playing fields. In addition to uh, that particular increase, we do have a supplemental grant of uh, about, about a million dollars a year in Chapter 90 funds we use each year for pavement management and maintenance work. Uh, this year's construction management uh, for pavement is going to be uh, over $2 million we're anticipating in Chapter 90 funds and also the infusion of the proposed fiscal 15 uh, capital improvement of $500,000. Uh, obviously, from your uh, books, you can see that the general fund is uh, $2.6 million this year. Um, under the water enterprise funds, um, we've completed the phase two dam studies, which outline necessary improvements that need to be done in the future. There are multi-million dollars worth of projects to be done over time. Uh, we've also worked with the local communities where our dams are located um, and uh, updated emergency response plans with all those um, uh, all the six water supply dams were done also with the communities. Um, the past year, water supply estimate management plan was completed and we're implementing some of the uh, capital improvements, such as uh, water line construction on North King and Chestnut Streets, and um, other ones that will be coming on in FY15 are Pine Street Bridge, Hinkley Street, Winslow Ave, and the proposed Con Street Roundabout which will go into construction next year. Uh, we had a small increase this year of 1.93% on the water side. Uh, for an individual using 3,400 cubic feet a year, that's about $3.74 increase for an individual based on that. Under the sewer side, uh, we had some uh, quick emergency work done on uh, Woodmont Road where we had a force main failure from the Bradstreet pumping station. That was put out to bid. That's been reconstructed at this point. Um, we're working on the industrial park sewer um, expansion. Uh, basically, it's a dedicated 12-inch line to Coca-Cola to come into Bradford Street. Uh, that work will be done this, this year also. Uh, like I said earlier, we are completing our comprehensive wastewater management plan for uh, sewer and wastewater infrastructure. And uh, this year, we're going to be receiving our new five-year discharge permit for discharging the uh, wastewater to the Connecticut River. Uh, we don't anticipate any huge increases except the uh, requirements of the uh, sewer maintenance, which is called the CMOM work, um, and we're gearing up for that uh, uh, work coming up. Under solid waste, landfill, oh, excuse me, um, the Board of Public Works approved an increase of 12 cents per unit for water, or for sewer, for a 2.04% increase. Based on the, uh, an average of 3,400 cubic feet per year for an individual, that'd be another $3.74 increase. So it's a nominal increase, um, very similar to last year's increase. Uh, under solid waste, um, uh, like I said, the landfill has been closed, it's been capped. We have some punch work left with the contract to be completed this year. Other than that, um, you know, we just moving on with our operations. I did want to make note that the transfer station uh, operations this year and the solid waste enterprise fund, we're looking at a loss of $135,000. Um, basically, we had about a 20% loss or so in our membership from vehicle permits from the previous year, and uh, we're hoping to retain them. The board this year did not increase the sticker prices or the bag prices, and we're waiting to see how this year flows out um, as far as operations and finances before they make a decision. The big difference in the budget that you're going to see this year, we have a budget of $500, almost $52,000 versus the financial order that's going to the city council, which is 1.098 million, is the fact that we're paying off some debt service on the uh, old online landfill. Uh, there's a bond out there that goes to 2017, and we're paying that off in this fiscal year, that by 15's budget. So that's the big difference you're gonna see between the actual budget and the financial order in front of you. Obviously in March of 2014, the city council approved the new enterprise funds for stormwater management and flood control infrastructure. Um, this, will allow, this fund will allow for the compliance of the upcoming federal MS-4 permit and other mandates on the city flood control systems by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, initial projects during FY15 is to replace a collapsed line on the city flood control levy that extends to a portion of Eastern Avenue. Um, this actually, some of this work in Eastern Avenue was identified in the CDM stormwater report. Um, we're also going to have a study performed at the flood control pumping station off Hockman Road to determine the adequacy to serve going forward. Um, and uh, DPW will continue other engineering maintenance work on the levy systems for the Army Corps of Engineers certification. 
Uh, another small project coming out of the stormwater and flood control utility is a dewatering facility to be constructed to decant water from catch basin cleanings to reduce our disposal costs because they have to need to go to a landfill at this point. Uh, this year's uh, stormwater flood control budget is $1.98 million. And um, at the end of this, I just wanted to really recognize Jim Lorela, Doug McDonald, and Henry Levy for this uh, working on this new utility with me. They really did the heavy lifting behind this. Um, under the capital plan, which is included in the budget also, um, historically we use the other than ordinary maintenance or OOM accounts to fund current and future expenditures. This year I see now it's been changed where they're now listed in the capital plan with respective descriptions of what we're intending to do. So overall, I think the budget shows a much more, uh, a lot more transparency in it. it, especially on the staffing levels. It's breaking down our staffing levels into anywhere where they'll fit, you know, as far as um, my work in the general fund versus my work in the, each of the enterprise funds versus using the old way of the direct indirects that got kind of confusing and nobody really knew how, what was going on behind the scenes. So I really like the approach they took this year with the budget and uh, it, I think it cleans up things pretty well. Um, that's all I had with that. So, well, why don't, why don't we, why don't we have uh, entertain questions based on the narrative you just gave, and see if we can go from there. How's that? Sure. Uh, Councilor Adams, you had your hand up, and then Councilor Large. When you were explaining the average increase mm -hmm. per person for water and sewer, how is that calculated per person? I mean, how did, it's based per on household. It's on thirty-four hundred units per year, which is what passes through your year. That's what we historically have always used it for an individual rate is 3,400 units oh, wow. uh, Councilor Barton? Yes, and that, um, are, isn't there going to be a change on Glendero landfill in regards because of all the problems that we had with people coming in with their leaves and their branches? Aren't we changing hours and so forth? We have Wednesday morning hours. We have yeah. Saturday hours. We have also have a leaf and yard weight drop off at the front end of the facility for small loads rather than people going out back all the time. Right. And I thank you for that because yeah. there was such an outcry about there that. There was. So we recognized that and that changed I believe um, back in, uh, I think it was April it changed. Thank you. Council Don. So for the million dollars for water line replacement, mm -hmm. it's really just two projects, which gives you a sense of how just really expensive it is to replace a water line, I guess. Um, so that drew my attention. I wanted to ask about Cons and Pleasant Street. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned, I think I caught you saying it had to do with the construction of the roundabout. That's correct. Okay. Which is um, a state project in mostly. Right? That's correct. But is it is the fact that we're digging it up, we're going to have to make uh, changes to the water line underground, or is it an opportunity where we wanted to do this anyway? It's an opportunity that we want to make changes. Um, it's an old cast iron line out there. I forget the year it was. Um, maybe 1920s, 1930s. So it's used as it's useful life at this point. But anytime the state comes in with a reconstruction project, we look at our utilities and whether or not we should replace them with the new construction project. Okay. This is their um, niche's engineering estimate to do the work out there which is replacing the line and going up to the dike system or the levee system. And you envision that work within the next year? They're talking putting out bid documents in fall, early winter for spring construction. This is why we include it in the FY15 budget because we might have some financials hitting it this fiscal or this next fiscal year. Any other questions? Uh, Council of Bargain, yes, Council of also, Ned, um, is your department actually starting to look at what we're going to do with the Glendale Road landfill? Because we have brought it up many, many times, even through the um, Energy Commission with Chris Mason, and doing all of us sitting at the round table, which you were there, where many of us agreed about solar panels, solar mm -hmm. energy. What's happening with this? Uh, right now, we're waiting for the landfill to be completely capped and closed. Um, after that, we can start looking at putting proposals out on the street as to what we might want to do out there, size of system, what kind of ownership it would be, um, how that would be managed going forward. So it's taking some baby steps, but it has nothing concrete yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilor, do you have a question? No, no, just no, a point. Okay. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I know you gave kind of a general overview, and our schedule does show broken into three parts. So, will there be a separate? I mean, are you good for we have, we're looking at a breakdown look, of stormwater? You, that's right. You're looking at a, a an agenda that um, I didn't put together, so it kind of caught me off guard. I was confused. Like By this. the way, this is my bad. I own this. And that's it's, okay. It's, 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 um, it, Just talk. No it, it, he generated with after an informal, an informal conversation, and uh, I didn't communicate with Ned essentially some of the areas that I think that were critical to focus on. Um, I don't think, I mean, one of the reasons that roads comes up because it comes up every year about every time about this time of year, and we don't often get a discussion about it. And and I think it's important that we hear from Rich Parcelletti, and we also hear about the challenges that have been facing the Department of Public Works. The stormwater view, that goes without saying, that was pretty, I mean, we have talked that, I would say, of all the issues that you're discussing, that's the one we probably have a better sense of, given the fact that we're so fresh off that conversation, but. And I'm, I'm not asking, uh, the only reason, I was just logistically, whether it's appropriate to ask questions now about, or to make I'm, you comments. Know, I'm, so. I'm perfectly comfortable with any way that you ask questions on how you do it, just so that so that, that, that and then, then you can call upon. Uh, if you like to recognize Jim, yeah, recognize actually, if Jim, if, well, Jim and Rich, you want to pop up here and you sit up there, you mean? Yeah, I'm afraid so. We got we got Rich dressed up in a suit again for crying out loud. Where are we going tonight? This is the only other suit that I have, so I can't come to anyone. He's now he's now burned out his suit collection. He got me beat by one. So, so I guess um, we had, uh, so thank you. I just wanted to quickly, since we don't have a um, separate presentation from Terry, but publicly just acknowledge all the help that you folks have provided in the, the lower state street and church street neighborhood and after the uh, event last week which was pretty horrific for people and this, as uh public white has said that something like that really underscores why it was so necessary for us to have um generated this stormwater utility thing. Um, because uh, with global warming, with the things that have been all about the city, it's just that you know, we're going to need we're going to need resources to help many many parts of the city. But this was one that you know I'm directly impacted. But so many other people really have just been really hit hard financially. Most because with stormwater, with floods, mm -hmm. there's no insurance. That's that's the biggest piece. So, and I just saw the building commissioner come in with you know that it's at least $35,000 just in mechanicals that people are paying out of their pockets now for furnaces and water heaters and everything else. Um, so just a, 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 any, any place I can just insert how important it is now that we have that and how appreciative I am that these folks have been really right on there and that people see it, people are, people just, just seeing the presence of the trucks in the area and knowing that we're talking about it at the board. Um, it gives a little bit of hope and be pretty where folks have felt pretty disheartened. I'll leave that. Hope is much better than despair, ultimately. So, um, questions for the, our illustrious panel here? Any, any questions about it? Uh, Council O'Donnell and then Council Murphy, who you have for you just 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 to play. I'll try to come up with a question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Right. I was just going to ask if you had a question. <laughs> my, my, my question is um, building off Councilor Carney's. Um, it seems like most of the money from the stormwater fund is pretty well spoken for, um, since there are big ticket items, as you know, discussed over and over again um, in, in the process of creating the stormwater enterprise fund. But then again, we have every once in a while these projects that, uh, or potential projects that emerge that are, uh, they might have happened before, but suddenly their urgency is underscored. Um, it, what, is the, what is the flexibility in terms of examining where storm, the stormwater enterprise fund might be used and for, for smaller expenditures here and there throughout the city? Or is it all just programmed you know, for the pumping station? And so on? Well, can I address this? Please. Um, well, I think as, as, as you know and the counselors know that the, um, the programming for the stormwater utility, which we repeated in all the different meetings that we had across the city, 
was carefully programmed, and I, I was going to say about the $2 million budget that we have or the $1.9 million budget that we have, there really are no surprises in there. So if I was to rattle off the projects, and Ned already mentioned, uh, mentioned, mentioned them, the river road retaining wall, the levee certification, Connecticut River uh, levee repairs, um, with some of the more expensive things that we're doing, um, looking at other things like uh, the Eastern Avenue drainage repair that Ned mentioned, uh, Hinkley Street drainage, a lot of these things are sort of programmed into the budget. There's not a lot of fat in that budget. Um, there was basically um, things that we read, we identified as priorities, and um, I think as the city went through the process of determining sort of the conversation about the cap and needing to be sensitive to the amount that people pay in conjunction with all the other um, taxes and water and sewer bills that we send out, we need to be cognizant of affordability. And um, that's sort of a long lead-in to say, there's not a lot of money in the budget for unexpected things, but there is money in the budget for things, for problems that come up, right? Because the, the whole idea of the utility was that there are a lot of problems that we're aware of, but there are other things that happen every year, every month, every day, sometimes problems that happen that require um, funding to, to improve. And the Church Street situation clearly is one that was not on the radar and not one that was discussed, right? When we walked around the, the community talking to everybody in each ward, you know, we weren't showing pictures of Church Street and that sort of thing, but clearly based on, um, you know, the, the flooding events that have been happening there, you know, it is a priority to find ways to, uh, to improve drainage systems down there and reduce the risk of flooding. Um, to talk a little more specifically, um, in the in the budget, we have a fifty thousand dollar budget for in, for engineering services. So these would be unidentified things that come up that we need outside experts uh, outside expertise to help. Now, if you live on Church Street, you'll see we've had a lot of engineers down there the last couple of weeks. We're doing surveying, we're developing some plans, we're doing a lot of permitting and things in house because we have a great deal of expertise. So we can re we can keep the cost down for the city on the things that we do by using the people that we have. We've got great people. We can do the things that we that we can do in house. In terms of monies for uh, capital projects, we have a five hundred thousand dollar drain replacement account line item in there. If you went through, you'd say mm -hmm. you probably said, "Well, geez, it's a half a million bucks. You know, what's what's that all about? What are they going to do that? What are they going to do that money?" And some of that money will be for the Eastern Avenue project that Ned mentioned in the Hinkley Street. But we'll look at the timing of those projects. Hinkley Street. Um, is probably going to hit in the next fiscal year, so some of that money will need available. Eastern Avenue will be this summer that we'll do that. But that still leaves at least a couple hundred thousand dollars for the drain replacement work that could be done. So um, I'm encouraged by the fact that the utility exists and that these sorts of monies are available. We couldn't scratch $5,000 together a couple of years ago uh, to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I find it very encouraging that we have in-house expertise to do things. We have in-house capabilities in, in Rich's department to do some construction work with the people that we have. And we have some money to do other projects um, from the funds that are in the utility. So um, I'll just say as the city engineer, we feel better equipped to be able to respond to the, to the needs of the community because we have this new enterprise fund. Um, so we can't pay for millions and millions of dollars worth of projects, but it puts the city in a better position to be responsive to the residents. Councilman, I really do have a question. I knew you did. I knew you did. You know, it's a million dollar question. Pavement. You know, with Lawn Avenue, the potholes have potholes. So, same with Milton Street. You might want to take a note of potholes. Okay. But, uh, you know, that's the nice thing about the new enterprise fund as well, uh, because all of these streets have stormwater, they have water, they have sewer, and I know they all contribute to your decision when to pay because you can replace through the enterprise funds those utilities and, and then leave the pavement budget to just the surface. But uh, I know we tried in capital improvements to add some money in, in a multi-year plan so some of those streets can be addressed. And um, some streets people can just avoid, but streets like Woodlawn and Milton, because of the high school, you can't <laughs> avoid them. And uh, uh, Mr. Duffy at the front end place says thank you. I met him having coffee this morning. He said, "Don't fix those roads." But you know, that, that's probably the thing I hear the most from my constituents about is, "Please get to that." And I'm glad that some of the new enterprise fund will help stretch those paving dollars a little farther. Okay. Yeah. 
can I speak to that briefly? Sure. Um, because we, we, we do have some information to uh, present on that. And we try to help all residents, including Mr. Duffy, with his business. So in a way, I guess we're helping. He says everybody. thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Um, we're quite excited, actually. It, it's probably hard to believe, but I think we're quite excited about what we're going to be able to do this year in terms of pavement management for the city. Um, it's been a heck of a winter with potholes, and um, Richard can speak to the pains and, and the challenges that his department faces every day. And of course, every councilor uh, hears it from your constituents about the, the sad condition of the city streets. But um, we've been working, Ned and I, and Richie, and people in engineering on a pavement management plan coming up for this fiscal year. We have more money for pavement management now than we've had in probably uh, who knows when. We've got about we've got over two million dollars, about. $2.5 million, right, in money is available for pavement management in the city. Um, it's a remarkable amount of funding, and we think we're going to be able to do um, a lot of different things for that money to make the streets better. Um, we, uh, Council Barge was talking to Richie earlier this week about the streets that we were going to do, and what our plan was, and we, we, uh, we had been working on a pavement uh, project list that was approved by the board recently, and we posted this memo on our website um, today or yesterday, it seems like all one long day lately. Um, but this information is available and what it does is it describes the different types of pavement met methods that we have to improve the, the streets. Um, we have, and we've listed the streets where we're going to do work. So there's um, crack sealing work where we go and we try to um, best maintain streets that are in pretty decent condition by sealing the cracks that exist so we can get extended period of time out of the, out of the pavement. And this, this page, you can't read, but you can just see there's a ton of streets on this. These are the, these are the streets that we're playing on crack sealing. So I would encourage people to, to look at that and see what we're doing there. Um, we have a long list of, uh, we have seven streets that we plan on doing mill and, mill and overlay. So basically milling up the existing pavement that's in pretty poor condition, laying down new asphalt. Um, and that we're spending about an estimated $1.17 million on on seven streets that we're going to mill and overlay. Um, we're do doing you have some, the name of the streets on that? We're doing, uh, I do, you want me to rattle all those off? Yeah. Um, so in Florence, Main Street, North Main Street, uh, basically from South Main Street up to the Roundabout of Park. Um, North Main Street in Florence from the Roundabout to Florence Street. Um, we're doing Jackson Street from Bridge Road um, to about 400 feet north of Barrett Street. Um, we're doing uh, North Street, the section between King Street and Market Street, which is in tough shape. Um, Chestnut Street in Florence, uh, the section from, from Main Street to High Street. We'd replaced the water main in there, and we were digging that street up there recently. Um, so we want to go up the mill and all the way there. And then on Bridge Street, from Pomeroy Terrace to Orchard Street. And then lastly, Prospect Street, from Locust Street to Jackson Street. Um, so that's about $1.17 million. We have other streets um, that we're doing an overlay only, so we'll put a, a, a layer of fresh asphalt over a couple of streets. And the ones that we've identified there are Woodmont Road from the bike path to North Street. We've been working on, we've been working down in, in Ryan's Ward for three years or something. Uh, pump stations and Boris Mains and everything. <laughs> we know everybody by name. Um, um, but we're going to put an overlay, actually, we did the overlay on Woodmont um, Eastern Ave, which Ned had mentioned. Um, we're going to be doing an overlay on that entire street after we fix the drainage problems that are there. Um, we're doing a reclaim uh, uh, work on a couple of long stretches of street on uh, Sylvester Road from Turkey Hill Road to about 7,700 feet north of the Turkey Hill Road intersection. And then Bridge Road from Francis Street to Jackson Street um, are two of the ones that we're doing. Um, we're also doing a little bit of um, research on using rubberized chip seal, which is sort of another method of um, extending the life of e existing pavement. It's a procedure that other towns have used that we, we haven't used. And we identified Barrett Street uh, as a project for about $40,000 that we'll be able to apply a coat of rubberized chip seal and monitor its performance to see how well how well that works and whether we would want to do that on the city streets. Um, if it works out to be a, a good economical way to extend the life of the pavement, then that's something that we're looking at doing. And then we have a number of streets that um, the highway department using city forces um, and funding will look at box paving, which is um, basically using in-house equipment that we have, staff that we have, to do smaller sections of street to improve the pavement condition. And depending on the availability of 
of Bridges staff, um, basically the time, what we have. We're looking at Coles Meadow Road, um, some sections of Audubon Road, Pomeroy Terrace, um, some uh, areas of Prospect Street, Bird's Pit Road, some sections of that, and Loudville Road. So depending on the time permitting and the amount of money that we have available, those are the streets. It's a pretty significant list. I rattled off a lot. I would encourage people to take a look at the list. Um, we're not sure if all the work will be done this summer. Some of it might end up um, just because of the volume of work may end up going into next spring. But we have a number of these contracts out um, for bidding right now. And then once we get those in, we're going to provide uh, updated schedules in terms of streets and scheduling and when the work is going to start and what the status is. We'll be providing all those updates for the on the website. So, Council's back. Yeah, I mean, I think this is fantastic because it's such a dramatic increase. I don't want to rain on your parade or create more potholes. But my understanding is that we should have been redoing, repaving streets. I think we, I heard this once from one of you, like every 14, 15 years. Is that correct? And so even, I just don't want expectations to be that this is going to be a perfect situation. Because we still are, have such a backlog, don't we, of streets to be done. It is so great that this is happening, but that's because we've had so little money to do the upkeep in years past, that now we're kind of approaching that place where maybe if we have this kind of funding year in and year is correct, this kind of funding year in and year out, we may be able to kind of be at a place close to where we should be to keep these roads where right. they should be. So last year we had um, a little over a $39 million backlog of paving in the city. That included maintenance work also, which is crack sealing and patching. It covers everything. Uh, we ran an analysis on it, I think it was two years ago, that if we fix all the city streets up to 100%, that we'd be only investing something on the order of uh, three or $400,000 a year to maintain them in good shape going forward for a number of years. So the object is to try to get those up to a, a good PCI or pavement condi condition index. And we're not going to get there at a million dollars a year or $2 million a year. In fact. Uh, the past few years, I was looking for four and a half million dollars a year for five-year capital plans each year to at least get us ahead of the curve a little bit. And I'm um, just thankful we have a half million dollars this year. So, so even, I just want to make sure, so the expectation on a few years from now, like, God, you guys came in since you had all this money for the roads, what's happening? If this is, we really need this and more to do that backlog. Of 39 million, right. but it's great we have this because it is better than the last few years. Right, and the proposed capital plan skips every other year, so next year there's zero coming in. We still have our roughly million dollars a year from Chapter 90 funds. There are some competing interests with that money for engineering studies, for traffic studies, things of that nature. So, not the full million gets used, but usually 800,000 a year is getting used to that, plus 100,000 for crack sealing. So there's other other demands on that on that fund that, and then I think in FY17, if I remember correctly, there's a million dollar infusion from capital improvements proposed, and then the following year or next two years, FY19, I think is 1.5 million. So and, and, and just so we're clear, just I think it was last year, a couple of years ago, we had this discussion the joint committee. But <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong with the figure, but we talked about at the rate we were going for a number of years, it would have taken something like 110 years to go around and do all the streets the way they should be. <laughs> so I just want to make sure the expectation of all this money is coming, all the streets going to be done, because otherwise next winter, guys, we'll have tons of calls again for oh, everybody. Yeah, budgeted money. all this money. No, we're just yeah. starting to have the kind of money we need to do this incredible catch-up that needs to be done over multiple years. What we've done a really good job at is really keeping the expectations low. We want to start there, yeah. and then right. everything that we problems. do, people are going to think is fantastic. Yeah, I, that is great. Yeah. Uh, Council Member. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, and, and there's multiple levels of dealing with streets. I know when you did Con Street, I mean, that was everything. The public utility, you did Dorn Street, same thing. Water, sewer, the gas company came and you did all of that. So some of the streets, when you prioritize them, if you've got to do all the utilities, that's a really major job. So you look at a street and you go, are we just going to resurface this? Well, not if you have to do all the utilities. So some of the people whose streets are in terrible shape, but you have to replace all the infrastructure, you've got to wait for the budget to do that because that's not just a resurfacing, that's a complete re restructuring down to the utilities and everything. Right. So North Street was $2 million to reconstruct it. Water, sewer, drain, the biggest one issue we had for 
three years was finding out how to fund the drainage improvements out there. Which theoretically now we have a source to fund. That's correct. The so the enterprise funds do contribute when it's a full reconstruction. That's right. They do. The, the issue is that, uh, and, you, and you'll, you'll see this reflected in water sewer bills, we don't have infinite amount of money to replace water lines and sewer lines either. So one of the things that we have to consider when we pave a street, when we look at the utilities, it may be that would be preferable to provide new utilities in that street, but we not, we may, the city may not always be able to afford new utilities in the street. And we're going to be in, at the point that sometimes of making a decision to pave a street without replacing the utilities because the money may not be available. We may need to replace a water line in the street and we may need to decide, well, can that water line last for another 15 years? And if the answer is yes, we think it can last 15 years, then we'll pave it, right? And then maybe 15 years from now, we'll go back and look and ask that same question. Do we have the money at this point to replace that water line when we repave the street? So it, it gets actually pretty complicated, right? When you think about the, the age and the, the condition of each utility in and of itself and then the pavement and marrying those to make a decision about which street's the best to do. So that could be why you've got a resident that says it's a no-brainer, the surface of my street is awful. Well, that's true, but so is the utilities under the street, mm -hmm. and you have to wait to be able to fund the whole package to redo the street, rather than just say, well, sure, I can slap pavement on it. But your, your water line is gonna make it another five years, so I, we gotta do the whole thing. Right. You know, a perfect example on North Street was both those utilities, water and sewers, were put in the 1890s, mm -hmm. and it's, 120 years old, mm -hmm. and those pipes have useful life lengths of 60, 70, maybe 80 years at best. We got an arrangement there, so we're fully we did. <laughs> But the, the other, you, you know how happy those people are when we leave that neighborhood and their streets. So it is uh, on a daily basis, people feel so good when they can drive down the street without their wheels falling off. So those people down there are really, really happy. We were on Con Street when we did Con Street. It was just such a wonderful thing. It's about 650. I think we need a question for the highway superintendent while we're talking about oh, it. Okay. It's going to lead into that actually. It's going to actually, um, the re I discussed this with Rich, and I think that Rich Parcelletti gets a lot of ice balls chucked at his head yes. without him even knowing it. It looks, good. It looks, good it looks, good. It looks all right. Uh, we, we, we had a rather uh, phenomenal winter and spring that uh, manifested as potholes. This was not uh, due to neglect, and I think it was important that Rich got an opportunity to explain um, the challenges that he was facing this season and seasons coming. And uh, you know, we've touched on it certainly, but I think I think Rich, if you want to want to take a shot at this, and it, now's your opportunity to to weep openly in public if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to say, in the 25 years I've worked here, this when this spring was probably the, one of the most hectic springs since probably the early, probably 91 or 92, when the, the condition of the city roads were very similar. But we, um, we used to spend a lot of time using coal patch, which you don't use anymore, which is just a cold version of blacktop that really is only just for wintertime use. So um, we have increased our ability to actually produce and make uh, hot asphalt every year. But we have two reclaimed boxes that we use in the winter time, which we actually in the fall we, we make blacktop, we make curbing, and then we cut the curbing up in small pieces, and then we hand load it into these two machines, and we can have up to almost eight tons a day. So in the winter time, when the blacktop plants are closed, you'll see us driving around with this hot box unit that the guys are showing how blacktop out of that stuff that's manufactured by us uh, in the fall before the plant closes. So just to give you a little rough overview for this year. So far, this fiscal year, as of yesterday, we've used 1,339 tons of blacktop, and that's all shoveled by hand to fill potholes. So a total cost of $108,934. Um, so from basically March until presently, we've used uh, 644 tons to patch all the potholes. Sylvester Road, and with one that example, awful. we've been in like five times, we've done the whole road. And the, the problem that's happening now is that that road in particular, and a lot of city roads are in uh, Woodlawn Avenue, there's another one, that we're just patching patches on top of patching. So what happens is the patch that's underneath it gives way, that's old, and the new patch we put in doesn't stay. And then it rains, and then a heavy vehicle goes over it, and that's the end of it. So deplorable. So we will forever be constantly patching roadways like this until we are able to catch up um, in our identified streets that need to be paved. And that's why this. We worked very hard to get this this memo out and to, to get this 2.5 million dollars worth of paving out because I'm, the the amount of um, personal services that we are spending patching um, 
is exhausting us in a sense because we are really having difficulty time functioning and getting other things done, which is regular routine maintenance, because we have the tree crew has been patching really since uh, April, and we haven't done very little tree work only on an emergency basis. So um, this year so far from our, our uh, records, we've had about 558 pop-up work orders, and uh, 443 of those have been completed. Um, give or take, because we have got, we have actually started a, our work on our third, we're actually on our fourth work order system, which we are working diligently to try to remedy it. But so, um, but that th those numbers reflect actual work orders that were you know called in by residents um, through either C click fix, um, request tracker, which is now the uh, the new uh, work order system that we use for the city website, and our own internal system, which we use is ViewWorks which quantifies uh, how much time that we spend actually filling potholes. So at any given time, if you want to know how many times the Vesta Road has been done, you can just call the office and we'll actually tell you. And how much I know how many it. times. Okay. <laughs> um, and then of course, that those work orders also don't reflect places where public works crews go that they know there's typically a lot of potholes that happen. So um, there's actually probably a lot, there are more, there could have been more work orders, but there's just, you know, so many that we are able to complete, which actually I think that's pretty good considering how many potholes we've had. But, you know, some of this, we have typically a four-man crew that does potholes and they basically finish usually typically in July. This year it's gonna be a little different. Uh, I'm hoping to finish a little sooner so then we can actually start to tackle um, the in-house work on this paving list, which is box paving, because I've committed to getting box paving done in uh, June, or starting, sorry, in July, in August. And I would like to get those streets done because some of those streets that we identify in the box paving process are streets that we typically patch over and over and over again. So once they are covered up with two inches of blacktop, we will be able to go and address other things uh, and they will last for hopefully five to five to eight years. So it, it's, it's a challenge, it's a challenge. And I have a great crew, I can say that they are, <coughs> you know, they, they work, we've worked a lot of extra hours, we've worked a lot of overtime in order to accomplish getting the potholes filled, but unfortunately I'm sure you'll drive through your wards on your way home from meeting tonight, and there'll probably be more potholes because of the rain that we had. So please don't hesitate to call the office. Yeah. Council Carr. Um, yes. Thank you. So you just mentioned that the, um, there's a new system, it's Request Tracker? Yes, Request Tracker. It's actually on the city's, it's on the city's okay. webpage. Okay, so I tried to report something from, and got a message back saying that, that we're no longer using. That, that, that would be C-click C -click fix. fix. Yeah, the C-click fix yeah. is no longer. No longer uh, using that. Oh, okay. So we've migrated to Request Tracker because that was the. Uh, um, Similar uh, app to your phone? A, it's a, you can use it through your phone. It's just that internally the way it works is a little differently. We do get the information, but what will happen is that the staff person in our office We'll actually get the request and then we convert it into our own internal work order system yeah. that actually quantifies uh, how, much, how much time we spend, how much material we use. So, but in terms of uh, for citizens to use, do you have that? Or I don't. No. So that would be helpful just because there's a lot of people mm. who like to yeah. it's, it's see right, it's do right the on same the main thing. page of the, the city's webpage. Okay, great. Councilor Klein and then Councilor Rodon. I just want to say, um, I'm going to take Mary Ann's role for a change and say thank you because I actually did distribute amongst Ward 7 residents the information about how to use the system. And pretty much across the board, I heard back from folks that within a week after they used that system, the potholes were filled. So I thought that was good timing. So thank you very much. I also wanted to just ask a question, uh, a, a broader question. I mean, is, do we have a sense that we're throwing good money after bad and filling these potholes because it really doesn't last and it, we're just putting on a Band-Aid that falls off a day or two later kind of thing? Um, you know, is that where we're at with most of the roads at this point? Well, I would say there's a, there's a lot of roads we have that issue because we're re basically, like I said earlier, we're taking staff time to go address similar potholes over and over again. So by having our pavement management system up and running and having it funded with two and a half million dollars, hopefully that'll alleviate some of that. But I would agree with you, it, it's very frustrating. It is like throwing good money away because mm -hmm. you're just back there doing the same thing over and over again. And until we're able to catch up on the backlog that we have citywide, we, we, were gonna, we, we are obligated to continue to do that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. the answer's probably yes. Yes, and the longest There's no way around it without, without capital. The, um, the consequences of unsubsidized deferred maintenance choices yeah. that, that, that doesn't start here, it starts 
farther downstate and, and the federal government too. Yeah. So just so you know, uh, I think it was three budget years ago, we had only $25,000 a year for uh, buying asphalt for potholes. Now we're $100,000 every year. So we've had to up it quite a bit just to keep up with our infrastructure that's falling apart in front of our eyes. This is a national crisis and it manifests here in our homes. And Northampton is not unique in that in any respect. Uh, I would say that we're unique in that we have, a, a, have an aggressive, conscientious DPW that actually hits these things hard and they, can, they hear a lot from their constituents. Councilor O'Donnell's next on Councilor LaBarge and then Councilor Murphy. Councilor Adams? No. Um, I, I like to say thank you too, just because I want to make sure to suck up to all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> now that that's out of the way. Um, this is just something that occurred to me, so I'm going to ask it briefly, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but the largest item in the highways part of the budget is gas and diesel. Mm -hmm. And we just talked about a state program for grants, um, for electric vehicles, for parking enforcement. Um, I, I don't have the five-year capital budget plan in front of me, but has that ever been contemplated as, as, as something that you could do for certain, certain vehicles you use? Um, are there state programs that we could model? There are state programs, however, the thing is when you start looking at these heavy duty trucks that are running constantly, it's not going to run off a battery work. source. You know, if they're up in a boom in a truck of doing tree work, right? Okay. it needs hydraulic power from okay. an engine, not, not electric. So some of our bigger trucks are probably not an option. We right. do have two hybrids in the department, um, Ford Escapes. Uh, that's as far as we've gotten, as far as going to some kind of a gas hybrid vehicle. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, I forgot who I did in what order. Council right? LaBarge. Uh, Council LaBarge and then Council Murphy. I see that you still have three vacancies, I will spell it. And the, and the general highway? Is yeah. Two of, the, two, of the vacancy, two of the vacancies that are new positions with no. the stormwater utility? No, this is just not a uh, so it speaks. So the, this, this it says highways. Yeah, there's actually uh, there are two there are two vacancies. There are, there's a special motor equipment operator vacancy that you probably that has been filled. Just okay. didn't make it on here. And there's a motor equipment operator mm -hmm. which is in the process of being filled. That job's been posted and the, the uh, posting is closed. The other two positions are not filled, they are vacant. The motor equipment repairman and the traffic signal maintenance. And that really affects your apartment. Uh, it does quite a bit. We're, we are working on those. The motor equipment repairman's advertising, of course. It was, it, it was advertised, to be truthful, it was advertised once and we had only one person apply and they did not meet the minimum qualifications. And you see the offer? You have to have a commercial driver's license, hoisting license, and a whole other host of licenses in order to be a mechanic. And that person did not uh, uh, have those proper licenses. So we have to rethink the job and repost it. How are your summer programs? I know usually you work something out with the schools and you have some of the students working during the summer. How is that going? Well, we t typically we have co mostly college students. Oh, okay. We don't, we don't, no unfortunately. No high school students? No, because they typically, if they are, some high school students have worked for us, but you have to be 18 okay. in order to be covered by the city. Oh, well. They're in China. Yeah. Council Mark, one was a big truck question. I know capital improvements, we got you this fantastic wind cloud thing that never showed up for this last snow season, did it? Showed up at the very, very, the very, very showed up, yeah. showed up after the last <coughs> snow storm. Mm -hmm. So we can look forward to you're really winging the snow next year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a beautiful truck. Yeah. More phone calls for Richie then. Yep. Well, I'm kind of hoping we don't have a lot of snow. Well, I'm <laughs> hoping so too, but it'd be nice because I mean, I know we, that was a priority of capital improvements a while ago and it just took a long time to get delivery. So. That, hopefully that makes a difference in quality, street quality next winter. Vehicles, vehicles aren't cheap. No, and they don't seem to be a supply of them. I mean, how long did it take to get that from when you ordered it? Uh, we ordered it in July and it came in March. So, yeah, it's not like you just get those off the lot. Right. You know, the other thing I want to remind people about, if you remember back when Proposition 2.5 started, this department was the most decimated of every city department. And, and really, I think you can trace this recovery back as far as 1980 because they didn't get behind in just a couple of years. I mean, it's been a long time, a long that, time. that the money yes. hasn't been there for the streets and, that, and that's where the backbone came from. So this is the, the legacy of not taking care of our streets goes back to the 80s. So it's, it's a tough situation to try and play catch up now. Council LaBarge. 
Richard, I want to thank you. I want to thank Jim for dealing with me as a city councilor and all my residents in Ward 6 every day, seven days a week, about when the pothole is going to be filled. And that I want to thank you also as the director for working with the residents in Ward 6 and the residents throughout the city. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Gentlemen, thank you so much. Best thank of luck. Time. Thank you. Best of luck. I appreciate yeah. your time, too. Well, I didn't let him off the hook. He was just looking pretty. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put on a suit for nothing. That's a, yeah, he's just. He's just he's he's just if you have any other questions, please feel free to call me. No, we will. Thank, thank you. you. No, we will. Thank you. Who are you up next? Uh, this is the building commissioner. Uh, <laughs> What's that? Oh, uh, uh, this is page 59. Oh, can you tell us Yep, we Thank you. So, Louis, of course, you got queued up last, so consequently, there was a sense of anxiety and, 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 and speed, and I'm sure you really want to spend as much time as you want here, but... Uh, uh, we call this pent up aggression in your own I try to be last, that's the way... That's the way you do it. Yeah, the Kansas part of the house. We're trying to get out of here at quarter of, that'll give yeah. folks enough time to get some bad food for themselves yes. and then run over the council. No, I think we're good. We're good. We're right on time. Forty to our agenda right now. So. Lou, you have the floor. We can. I can make this really fast. I'd like a lot more money. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Um, first two. Uh, first two pages are basically uh, Susan's information. The last two are, are uh, sort of a summary of how the department. Uh, workload is increasing we're doing an awful lot more than we were i didn't put the i didn't bring the um complaint logs with me um, they're going up as fast as the permits but I mean, we're this year will be the biggest year fy14 will be the biggest year that the department's ever had by a significant amount by revenue or by complaints? By revenue, okay. by complaints, <coughs> by numbers of permits, by numbers of inspections. And, 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 uh, and, you know, in, in all measures. And we're working as hard as we can to keep up with it. I talked to Susan a little bit about being able to get some more part-time inspectors over the summer because we've got permits in hand that we're going to have to deal with during the summer. Smith College woke up. Um, right. Yes. Happy for a few years of, of uh, you know, projects not developing. Um, and if you look at the numbers of permits, about almost 80% of them are, are permits for $10,000 worth of work or less. And so the 20%. So we get quite a lot of. Uh, of really small permits that require a lot of inspections and a lot of discussions. Sometimes the you know the bigger permits require a lot of inspections, but it's the process is usually pretty straightforward. We're not working off plans off the back of napkins. Right. So 80% of our work um, is is on very small projects, which is more labor intensive. Is more labor easy? intensive, and and it's increasing too. Councilor Barth, are you raising your hand? You're yes, please. All right. Um, Louie, I want to thank you. Thank your department. I'm way ahead of you this time. For everything you've been doing in Ward 6. I know it's been keeping you very, very busy. It's been keeping me busy. But I thank you. My question is, in your department, like we had um, an inspector who left to go work in Hadley, and then People are just leaving and going to other areas. Do other cities pay more for a building inspector versus our city? Could you answer that? I could. We. Um, and I, I'm I've curious actually, about this because. Yeah, th there's not an inspector in our department that couldn't go somewhere else at the same level and make a good bit more money. Um, you know, I, I'm uh, more than 10% more. You know, I think that. Uh, 
if my job, if I had the job in Amherst, I just the high end of my salary range is below the starting salary range for the same position in, North, in Amherst. Um, it is a privilege to work in Northampton, um, and uh, I think that's what keeps a lot of people here. But um, we have we have uh, in the building department a little bit been you know the building instructors, not so much the building inspectors, and we've had individuals that got to a point, got some experience, and left. We've also, because it's a good department, we've gotten some people, we've gotten some very good people. Um, the last two hires, exceptional people. You know, and I, I'm, uh, we were able to make one of the clerk positions full time, which, which enabled us to get a better, you know, uh, to, to get somebody who couldn't have afforded to work part time. But if we could raise, if we could raise the bar, but I think any department in the city could say the same thing, that, uh, you know, and because because all the city, all the municipal um, budgets and salary scales are online, now. everybody gets a chance to look at what everybody else is getting. Mm -hmm. But I think Northampton is working hard to keep our ta they, you know the taxes low relative to the services that the city is able to provide, and you know that has to happen. Some something has to give to make that happen. Are you still on call, twenty four hours a day? Our, our department is. Um, I share the on call with one with the assistant commissioner, um, but you know, at any given point, and and we get calls. I mean, we get calls. You know, the church often <laughs> enough. I you know, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's once a week. I mean, we're at forty something after hours call outs this year. Um, some of those calls go on for a <laughs> considerable length of time. Um, you know, I think that I've been down to the Church Street that flooding four times now, uh, and and we're not done with it. Uh, and uh, you know we've been the, some of the projects that they look like a little deal, but they take up an enormous amount of time. We're on the verge of getting the old Honda deal knocked down, and that's been you know years of. You know, trying to make it happen, and uh, you know, hopefully going for the voluntary aspect of it. You know, ordering something to happen is is never the, is the last choice. But you know, that's you know, I think that we may have convinced the owner to take the building down voluntarily. But um, if not, we'll order it on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, Comes and, and you know, I mean, th that involves conversations with. As many as many people as you can imagine, including the city solicitor, and back and forth about making sure that we're on solid ground when we when we do something like that. So I, I want to um, say the same thing that uh, Councillor Labarge said, which is thank you very much. I've called you, and within hours you've dispatched somebody to check things out, and that's very much appreciated. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, one is we talked about these. Uh, 24-hour calls, and I'm wondering about why there is no overtime uh, uh, line item here. And uh, the other thing is you mentioned that there's been a, a pretty exponential increase in uh, complaints, and I'm wondering if you have any sense of why. Well, I think that the more responsive, I'll start with the complaints, and I think that the more responsive we are, the more people will feel comfortable complaining, and if we handle the complaints um, appropriately and, and uh, you know properly, it's there's no sense complaining if it's not going to do any good. And so, and we've we've worked around you know in the past few years to be able to better respond. Um, I, I just. I can't help but think of some of the complaints we've had recently. Yeah, some one. of them have been quite difficult. Um, some have been epic. Yeah. <laughs> and the overtime piece is that uh, we're NAP, you know, all the inspectors are, are in the NAPIA um, organization and we don't get overtime. We get comp time. And, but you're uh, saying you're napping a lot. Too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and, uh, so, so you know, that's why we work it out. So, Council Murphy. No, I, I also want to point out that, that they're a revenue generating department. Like, 
I mean, this year it's possible we don't generate as much revenue for the city as we spend in your department. Well, what, so, it'll be three. It'll be about the budget will be about three eighty, and the revenues will be about seven fifty. Yeah. So we, we we definitely are running ahead of the game. I'd like next year. I'd I'd like we'd like some more vehicles. I mean, we're spending an increase in inspections puts an increase in the mileage and if we had and, and vehicles are it's cheaper to own a vehicle ultimately. If the if the if the cash isn't there you can't do it. But I think that you know if we can carry another solid year I'll certainly be um, you know next budget season for support vehicles. Oh, and that was one of the discussions we had in capital improvements, you know, when, when we said, hey this we don't spend a lot of money on buildings, they generate revenue. I think we owe them a new vehicle because they, you know, when you make a statement like we don't drive our used SUV anywhere we're not prepared to walk back from, that was very compelling. That well, it's for a revenue generating department, we should buy a vehicle. I, I think, I mean, I feel like that's true for us. I also feel like it's true for most of the other departments. It's, it's, it's not, uh, what's happening for us is not unique by any stretch. I don't know how we resolve it, but, but I'll say again, the level of services that, that Northampton provides is, is at a significantly high level. Well, we say all the time, oh, it's okay, it's parking. They generate a lot of money. We pay for out of their revenue what they make. Well, you guys generate money too. And with the, the volumes up and you have needs, we should remember that when we sign that. It's a fun thing. Council Carter. Just a quick question. So does she know the So. What, what it's a right? it's a new it's a newly created permit um, and as an and there's there's a new code and the, so not the HVAC that's right here it's just a it's, any installation sheet metal uh, it's, it's HVAC sheet metal okay. and it, the permits are not particularly expensive that's why uh, there's not a lot involved there an adjunct to a regular building permit um, but but the state has created this whole system you're obligated to enforce. Well, can you, and just one other thing, the zoning permit applications, those are the reviews. Those are $15 questions at a time. I mean, that month, that amount of money came in $15 at a time. So it's, it's the initial appraisal, the initial uh, uh, interpretation of this, how the zoning ordinance is applied in particular situations. But those are very helpful to the citizens. Very they're the ones that, they're, that's the, the absolute beginning of almost any land use or building project in the city is one of those uh, determinations. Has the adoption of stretch codes increased your work hours or the, the burden on the department? Or it, it has, it has. And, uh, but, but interestingly, right now, the stretch code is not as stringent as the, as the regular energy code for the community because the folks in Boston haven't been able to get the new stretch work together. Um, but there's there's a specific set of criteria that we have to review now. And we we're fortunate enough to get a, a, a thermal imaging camera this year out of our budget that, that makes it a lot easier. But we're looking at houses now at, at where with a, for for new construction, where is the air where is the heat going to get out and go back in there and fix that spot, which is you know that's something we've never we didn't used to do the stretch code promotes it. We have a, we got enough funding this year to buy the camera to do it. Council of Arts, did you have another question? Oh yes, I did. Sorry. Okay. Louis, we have three minutes. Since, pardon. We have three minutes just to let you know if well, you want to get something to eat. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the clock is ticking, Bill. Uh, um, I, I'd like to ask you on um, the Williamsburg. Williamsburg, and what else do you do besides Williamsburg? Hey, it's hey, Williamsburg. No. Oh, okay. Are, are we making money? Yes. yes. I've been very careful uh, about monitoring the amount of work we do there and monitoring how much we're charging. We've, we've been talking about a regional weights and measures thing. We've used the same model to run up the weights and measures budget proposed budget for this proposed regional system, which is that it, it's, it's the amount of time that each person spends and, and, and we add uh, 40, we add 50% of 
to their salary rate, plus we include the mileage, um, plus we include all of the costs of the, of the department that are involved in it, and present them with a, with a, a <coughs> price, and we adjust. In Williamsburg, we adjust the price every year. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Well, any other questions? Louis? Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, and that, there's, <clears throat> well, actually, we don't vote. We didn't move to convene, so we are adjourned. The hearing is ended. And thank you all very much for your time. We'll see you in 15 minutes.